thought that uh, there has been a lot of change in consumers and it's all about smart retailing and uh, uh, we in ui run a survey across about 20000 consumers globally including about a thousand in india on, on how their buying patterns are changing during uh, over the last uh, you know few months and it's run every uh, couple of months and the latest report has just arrived yesterday and i thought some of the snippets were very relevant uh, if to share just before we start so i'll take just a couple of minutes uh, maybe if you can go to the next slide can i yeah just move to the next one i think this Yes, so, so if we see, uh, I think there are some data points on the left which shows the kind of growth and penetration that we'll see in India and in mobile and digital. But what's uh, interesting is some of the data on the right. I mean, if you see, uh, you know, 94% uh, uh, who shop online uh, will use smartphone. Uh, so very, very unique in India where smartphone is, is almost pretty much close to most of the uh, you know, relevant for um, buying. 65% uh, will uh, make greater use of mobile banking as well. I think the, the banking tech and fintech is also going to play a big role. 34% uh, will use grocery delivery services more often in the future and 64% and, uh, uh, will use uh, more subscription services. So it just gives a kind of a flavor of how uh, the world has transformed uh, post-COVID. And uh, this is uh, probably a while it's an opportunity, it's a challenge. It's an opportunity for all the retailers, uh, you know, uh, in in the business. And maybe if you can move to the next slide, there's some more uh, data points on what uh, consumers are doing uh, while they're shopping. So if you see uh, some of these stats, you know, 56% or 70% uh, will spend more on experiences and 67% will do more shopping online and will only visit stores that provide great experience. So what, so if I look at, and, and this is not the, this is probably the fifth or the sixth edition of the study. So what is very clear is there is an increasing use in, in, uh, of online, but it is also about experience because uh, whenever we have offline stores, they are all looking at experience much, much more than what probably we would have seen uh, post-COVID. The second big learning is that the store visits have become very targeted, uh, which means that, uh, you know, people will visit stores. There is a huge chance that, uh, you know, they're going for a specific purpose of buying and not just because for browsing. And, and that probably, while it is not supposed to last permanently, but that's certainly going to be there for the immediate future. So these were some of the data points I thought I'll share with you before I throw it open. Uh, my request to all of you is probably you know just spare a couple of minutes on what you have been seeing in the market and what kind of changes have you seen so maybe you can start with amrish uh... yeah sure um so i think uh, like everybody hi everyone it's uh, nice to be on the panel and to uh, chat with all of you again um i think one of the the main thing is, of course, I think all of us are seeing uh, that the rising tide is lifting all boats as far as e-commerce is concerned. We're all, uh, the propensity to consume online has certainly taken a massive jump April onwards. Um, and it looks like the trend is uh, there to stay. Uh, those and those little bits of information that Pinaki has shared, including uh, mobile being 94% is similar. We are seeing the same thing in our business. Um, we are seeing... A greater acceptance uh, across most of our brands, perhaps not in our couture type brand, but certainly the uh, visibility of the brands online now is absolutely critical. We are, this has uh, led to two major, well, two shifts in our business. One, obviously, the speed at which we have decided to adopt uh, changes online has been accelerated. And secondly, our focus on marketing, uh, traditional marketing versus what we are doing online, even on a branding exercise has taken a significant uh, jump. So much in line with everybody else, our business is behaving in the same way. Uh, online, of course, brings with, its, brings with itself uh, some challenges. Um, cost challenges include uh, even though you don't need yeah. to pay rents uh, for stores, perhaps that's up the sales is substituted. But at the same time, 
you have to pay kind of a pseudo rent of being visible online, which uh, translates into sort of digital marketing. So the cost structure is similar. We are seeing, obviously, online, there is much easier price comparison to offline. So therefore, your margins get pressed in terms of your realizations. That is a significant uh, pattern online. So margins available online will tend to be uh, compressed compared to what a larger offline retailer would have seen. Um, so these are some basic things that I wanted to put on the table. So Amrish, uh, you know, one of the, uh, you know, uh, I mean, you have an advantage because you have a line which is more cooter, but you also have a line which is probably um, buying preferences different between the two lines, the, the more fashion oriented line with the, the your regular uh, line. How, how do you see the difference? Uh, actually, they're both, uh, uh, both lines. We have a Ritu Kumar brand, which is a um, uh, sort of contemporary Indian brand. And then we've got Label Ritu Kumar, Label. which is the younger fashion line. Both of them have seen growth online. Uh, I think the one important thing that we are looking to do is we need to curate our experience the same way we do in a shop, but uh, online, obviously, it's a different paradigm. We are very focused on our own website sales. I suppose we also operate in a slightly premium end of the market, which therefore allows us to have certain uh, product verticals which are not cannibalized by the marketplace, which tends to be a little more price competitive. So one is the experience of curating different price brackets, different lines between marketplaces and our website. So that's one important part of what we're doing. Uh, also, the experience on the website has become paramount. The experience, and by that I mean obviously uh, UI, UX, but also things like the photo shoots and how those, how expressive those need to be. It's no longer simple e-commerce shots. They need to also have a little more in there that, uh, you know, connote the message as you're selling as a brand. What you would try and do on a shop, you have to try and do in a uh, uh, online. Thanks, Am Amrish. Uh, Ramani, uh, very interestingly, of all the studies that we have done in UI, I think there's one message that comes out. Health is priority. Uh, I mean, every uh, country, uh, that is one among the top three. If, if we looked at the word cloud of, of the survey, I mean, health is number one. So what has been your experience and how have you leveraged this whole change uh, in connecting with the smart consumer? Sorry to disappoint you. We are not in health. <laughs> we are, uh, the name is Health and Glow, but it's largely... Uh, Beauty beauty and personal care and a bit of, uh, let's say, wellness, I would say, or general health. Uh, but largely, it is, it's, we started as a pharma plus beauty kind of a, a format. The pharma thing really didn't take off in India. So it kind of graduated to being more of a beauty and personal care kind of a format. And uh, a beauty uh, getting increasingly important. Uh, that's how we've been. But... Uh, so is there a change, uh, you know, in strategy? Because while you have a nice name and wellness, I mean, when I meant health, I, I meant uh, health and wellness. Uh, so is, is there some shift that you are seeing? Is there something that you are going uh, to do about that? Yeah, so I think uh, the, uh, the wellness and uh, let's say the immunity building uh, kind of really took a little more of importance during this pandemic. And I think... Um, while for the last two, three years, people have been talking about wellness, uh, it really didn't kind of explore the way it was. There was more noise. But during this pandemic, we've seen it actually kind of uh, grow. And uh, apart from just the precautionary ones, all these PPEs, etc., we've also generally seen things like immunity boosters, etc., gain currency. So we have, during the pandemic, increased our uh, space and assortment and offering for a bit of general health and a bit of wellness. I think that will keep growing in addition to what we do in beauty and uh, uh, this thing, personal care. And, and, and you, you feel that uh, it will help the beauty and personal care, uh, you know, from a more from connecting with consumers? Because at the end, one of the critical parts is how do you connect better with consumers in the whole digital world? So, uh, I don't know whether wellness is going to help beauty connect better with consumers. But I think fundamentally, if you look at the beauty of personal care space. One is really what you can do to hide your flaws and make yourself look presentable, which is largely the cosmetics part. True. 
the second is really what you can do to kind of nurture nourish and maintain which is what you do in terms of skin care and all that stuff to regular regimen and all that regime regime and all that the third is really the extended care and the inner care etc which is this wellness okay and that there are all kind i mean there is no standardization or proven standard it's more like you know more of kitchen recipes trying to gain scale or ayurveda finding its way or herbal stuff and all that so it's uh, it's a mix of believe and uh, proven or non proven efficacies so to that some extent i think it will kind of start gaining currency as we go forward but overall i think uh, uh, different aspects of personal care uh, have played out during this entire piece so for example with salons being closed in the initial part of the pandemic when we reopened suddenly all the diy kits were the ones that were flying off whether it was male grooming whether it was uh, hair removal kits whether it was hair dyeing uh, you know nail stuff and pedicure yeah. kits and manicure kits and all that because people wanted to do that at home and all these kind of products including shaving products and all that were kind of suddenly gaining currency yeah and uh, so so some of these things i think will continue because uh, it's not always that people want to go to a salon okay the second one is uh, so so at different points in time we see different kind of categories gain currencies the second was i think uh, more contemporary solutions stuff that is uh, free of nasty chemicals uh, more about natural products these are things that are really kind of uh, these have become a little more in in the consideration set compared to the past i think the consumer is a little more aware want to do stuff that they really want to kind of uh, they they feel will do good to them as opposed to just blindly going uh, or chasing brand salience i would say they become a little more uh, evaluative uh, plus i think there are a slew of uh, newer brand offerings that have happened during this period uh, and uh, we've seen those kind of you know uh, start taking on the established brands in this period some of these dtc brands etc and uh, while they are dtc brands uh, apart from kind of seeing the initial phase in on and presence and that's how some of the more popular ones have started uh, you know selling with us and in the last 5 to 6 months we've seen their share also gallop away i think they've got better products uh, more contemporary offerings interesting innovations compared to the large scale ones um, and i think the consumer is um, willing to give new brands a chance in so long as the ingredient and efficacy stories are interesting so uh, and i think it is the bane of the larger scale operators who not really been to crack good innovations for this country and i think the smaller new brands have really emerged with uh, being very nimble footed and uh, very fast on the uptake in terms of developing um, innovative formulations i think that's a very good point ramani i mean that's the other point which are survey through very clearly and, and i was quite surprised at how many people in india actually said that companies which are uh, you know more social in nature or companies which are more uh, you know worried about environment these are the kind of companies from whom they would buy the product so let's see how it pans out it looks like a very clear path to i mean direction is very clear i'm sure uh, companies like yourself will take full advantage of uh, you know how the consumer is seen Uh, coming to you manish i think one of the biggest uh, you know ch- uh, biggest uh, what should i say ch- changes if i may say so is people you know moving home and then people dropping their formal uh, you know clothes and getting into jeans and shorts so how have you seen uh, that change or the benefit uh, during the pandemic and what do sure. you think of the future how how will it pan out in the future so i think if i look at it as in in terms of uh, consumer behavior per se uh, the initial period saw uh, things like kids wear and uh, what we call as more like athleisure or lounge wear as in taking prominence against every other category so you had instances wherein you were running out of shorts and round neck t-shirts as compared to polos or any other categories were doing well but i think over a period of time as in people have realized as in that uh, it was a temporary phenomena things are changing but having said that i think athleisure as a concept was something that was gaining ground it has been fast forwarded so people are much more comfortable in terms of even going to office rather than as in working from home in a athleisure sort of a uh, uniform so to say uh, those are things as in i think which will continue going forward if i look at denim per se again uh, 
denim has been evolving over a period of time as in the aspect of comfort on denim as in whether we look at uh, any brand across the world so stretch pepe was all about stretch but but really if i look at it, every other brand is talking about stretch things like knitted denim i think those are changes so denim as a concept has evolved as per the change uh, or in the needs of the consumer or the demands of the consumer so that's something that's going to continue but i think the bigger change is going to be in terms of the consumer looking at and that's something that uh, ramani was also stressing in terms of consumer demanding uh, justice for nature or sustainability so i think those are concepts which are with, becoming very very strong uh, we were as in uh, pr- previously it was brands primarily who were pushing it and they weren't sure as to whether the consumer would take it uh, or if the consumer is going to be, be ready to pay a price for it but i think today it's becoming more like a given and consumers would prefer brands which are standing up for its environment which are standing up for social causes which are standing up for things like sustainability so i think those are very very important themes that will play uh, a role in terms of per se purchase decision for uh, consumers when they decide between brands i think is a very go- uh, valid point and as i as i was telling earlier i was also a little surprised about how strong this was in india because when we do this surveys we typically feel that it's all the europe and the us where we see this trend but i was surprised at least in our survey what we are consistently seeing uh, is that uh, the percentage of people who are talking of sustainability is actually higher in india now i don't know whether uh, that's a bit of a you know a recent phenomena where people have gone through some personal challenges and that's the reason they are responding but very importantly it is going to be a very critical part of any buying process in the future i mean for across categories not just for apparel it will be there for food it will be there for everything Right. very important uh, point in fact i'll tell you our experience on it we started talking about sustainability two years back and we have seen as in so it it was pre pandemic also that we saw traction for it it just that if i look at the last 9 to 12 months that traction has increased but i think that movement in terms of uh, actually preferring things which uh, uh, which are sustainable was was coming in the indian minds uh, uh, pre pandemic also agree fair enough Tirthan, one point for you. I mean, when we all talking of digital, I think the, the general conversation is all about, you know, going from the tablet or going from the phone uh, and buying. Uh, you have a unique uh, a solution which is very store oriented or a warehouse oriented. So, how do you see your uh, business model change, and how do you, uh, you know, now work with retail companies? What what kind of changes are you seeing? I mean, uh, I mean, just to. to give you some facts i mean even denison as a company right we, we are huge in, in label industry uh but as 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 discussed by the steam panelists what we have noticed is that uh, visibility and uh, corporate social responsibility these are two major influences which are actually influence, influencing the the mind of the general consumers in india and that is why when we did a global survey uh, our organization we came to the conclusion that everybody is going to shift uh, specific to let's say supply chain and retail to a digital identity so so basically each and every product of the shelf will have a unique identification number that's the concept so that's why within every denison we have a, a a subdivision called il which is intelligent labels now that is our focus is that primary right now 80% of a business is from the uh, labels uh, industry label industry and we are seeing a shift that by 2025 we want to push that uh, revenue up to 40% from digital innovations right and when we say digital in- innovations we mean uh, every unique identification for every uh, be it jeans be it t-shirt on the retail uh, chain so that we can actually track not only where it's manufactured that they actually follow the child labor uh, laws uh, and things like that which which are very important in today's uh, uh, context A- and also the belief that it actually gives you a better visibility for example a brand let's say let's manish is here for example pepe jeans uh, spends a lot of money advertising right now if for example i go to a store and if there's no medium that's a loss for him now that's because of lack of visibility or the product is not it's there in the warehouse somewhere in the back end but it's not at the shelf 
now things like that so what we are seeing especially in uh, south asia and india is that a lot of brands are going for digital innovations with respect to a technology called rfid which stands for radio frequency identification now with that the roi and the visibility in supply chain is just amazing I and mean, there's the uh, luckily in india the, the the situation is that ecom the big ecom players uh, i'm not in a position to name them because uh, but but most of the major adopters uh, are are the ecom players and and they're doing it at every item level we have expanded our il business in india over the past 2 years by about 140% right uh, revenue jump and that is because of the rate of adoption of this technology is just is just uh, booming to the to the next level because of the visibility and also because of the track and trace uh, solution it gets and also because they understand how to fulfill the back end requirements with respect to you know uh, just for example let's say mintra they are the number one oh. selling uh, 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 what is it apparel ecom website in india now mentra after deploying rfid saw a, a a jump in their revenue by 32% not because of extra expenditure in marketing or extra expenditure in other things but because of the visibility in the supply chain and how they could manage the supply chain because of that right so uh, when for every dynason we we when we look at the retail industry overall we are looking at it as a digital platform where Uh, as someone mentioned in the panel that uh, you know everybody is going to have a nfc phone and that is going to increase the level of interaction between the end user and the brand uh, and the brand and uh, and uh, uh, just just to give you an example uh, in your survey you said that the experience of shopping matters a lot and and that is where exactly for example mintra is going they they have a in-house brand called roadster which is which is a premium segment within their a uh, brand and, and and their stores uh, two of their stores are digitally enabled with rfid where even if you are uh, if there's no sales person they can actually pick up the product scan it and get the entire details of what the product is all about where it was made uh, uh, and what to match it with and things like that right and also your billing can happen instantly right so so these are things which 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 uh, a lot of the e-commerce website and also we are in talks with a lot of the brick and mortar a uh, big retail uh, chains in india they are adopting it so so we 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 see that uh, uh, digital is the way forward uh, also for the back end and as well as from the front end because a lot of people would love to interact uh, with the brands and know more about the brands and and we see that nfc and as a enabler uh, in doing that and helping us achieve uh, the 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 recognition or the brand equity of brand value or loyalty that needs to be there in the market so you feel that this <laughs> supply chain as well as giving in better uh, overall experience uh, overall experience the customer experience in shopping i mean for example uh, uh, if if you if you go shopping during a festival you, you're going to stand in a line and somebody like me if i just want to pick up a pair of jeans i'm not going to stand in the line and wait for you know uh, and that's a loss for the store uh, in that case is uh, kind of a scenario for example uh, we provide the rfid inlays to to a global brand called uniqlo as well which is a japanese uh, brand now they have a section which is automated so if you have like four or five uh, manned stations for payment we have two or three automated uh, payment uh, options as well so they walk through that you know it's a seamless interaction so a lot of people in india are trying to implement that uh, but again it's a, it's just a matter of time before you start seeing things like that in india as well absolutely i agree absolutely. so malika coming to you uh, now uh, i mean uh, obviously the last few months have been quite trying for everyone so how how have you connected with your consumers and what kind of uh, trends are you seeing amongst your consumers sorry you are muted you have to unmute yourself hi yeah so you know we have been digital first so we've always had a very one on one relationship with the consumer and i think also the way the brand has been built is the brand's built on the founder's personal story and the personal journey right which is why um, you know it, it it's very very uh, for us very very conversational with the consumer we because we've been digital first i've always had you know information of my entire set of consumers uh we have always had a presence on our social handles which allows us to have conversations with them right so in uh, so for us things like 
everything from customer feedback to new product innovations to i think one of the colleagues on the you know on the panel also spoke about the fact saying that the brands are coming out with newer innovations the reason why we can do all of that and be nimble and do it fast is because we are directly having a conversation with my consumer i don't have to depend on a research agency what i do is uh, you know we have a property called mondays with malika where i go and speak to all the consumers on our social handle and i always leave them with a question in the end with an answer that i want so what is the new product that you want us to launch if you wanted to us to change something in our product what would it be right so we get first hand information and i've got 170k people on that platform who engage with us on that particular day so i think in terms of conversations what we have seen change especially in the skincare industry and overall is that the consumers becoming extremely aware the awareness about everything from products to ingredients to their benefits to even as we just talked about right being environmentally conscious is just very very high and because all of it is extremely high at this point of time it becomes extremely important for brands to have a to over communicate if i may just say it, right and digital just allows you to do a lot further communication with your consumer than anybody anything else would have so i think um, just the fact that there is one too much information and also an overload of information and hence simplifying communication to the consumer is becoming extremely important and at the same point of time the awareness on uh, you know being environmentally conscious is extremely important so i think practically almost every online brand has a tie up with an agency which gives them nutrification to the you know to the negative impact that they cause on the environment like we ourselves are tied up with a brand called repurpose global where the entire amount of plastic that we use we nullify it and that as a communication goes out to every consumer because there are certain people who are extremely edgy of not using products if you're not recycling your plastic there are people who wouldn't buy a product if it is tested on animals right so i think it's the awareness in the consumer which is pushing the brands to be far more conscious like you on mute so one question malika that do you see this whole pandemic as a kind of a you know fast forward for the offline player to become more online because uh, we have seen that they have been a little bit laggard and you are right like the biggest difference i see between the two is while both are required but what i see is that the nimbleness and and the speed with which a typical online player uh, you know can move uh, is not what we have seen in the past but do you think this is a great opportunity for i mean it will probably equate a lot of at least the level. playing field is now very clear whether it is level or not will only time will tell i think everybody is very clear that everybody needs to go omni channel which has become more and more clear i think the only advantage that the digital first brands had during the time of the pandemic is when everybody moved to digital as a choice of buying options we had past learnings which we could capture on and kind of grow you know faster in this period of time so while everybody was figuring out their supply chain to figure out how to sell on digital we kind of had an edge over everybody else there because we've been doing it for the last 3 years and i think that's where the new wave of b2c brands on exponential increase over the last 6 months and that clearly caught up the attention plus also the fact that your consumer is beginning to buy online and i think it's it's a responsibility of every business owner to be available wherever your consumer is shopping so that leaves you with no option so i think going forward also being omni channel is going to be something which is extremely important for everybody i think i think that's a that's a very fair point amrish uh, coming to somebody like you who have a, a very band of loyal consumers but have been traditionally offline uh, also play in the slightly premium segment also apparel is is, is a little bit more difficult category to uh, do online especially if you're a little more into the fashion how do you see companies like yourselves you know taking advantage of whole digital bandwidth well i mean piraki i don't see it any longer as a different channel i think it's now part and parcel of retail so there's no um i mean there's no question of the fact that you have to be powerful online as well and it helps that uh, the consumer psyche as you as many panelists have mentioned as have you has changed and therefore the comfort of Uh, purchasing online uh, has uh, grown exponentially so that helps even brands like us i think all brands it helps move it i think the things to I mean, there's two parts to this one i think the actual uh, process of selling the the actual uh, alchemy of selling 
intrinsically doesn't change. Um, you just have to be able to provide that alchemy in both mediums. And what I mean by that is, uh, Malika, for instance, she said that she has these conversations with her customers. I mean, that is such a unique way of selling. Um, and that is something she's able to do online through the tools she has. Similarly, we have conversations with our customers, slightly different conversations, but where we used to train our sales staff, now those conversations need to happen online. So I think it's a matter of good selling and being able to draw parallels between wherever you're available. I think certainly online will take the place of certain offline channels, which were a little more uh, offline channels, which behaved a little bit more for convenience, sort of perhaps stores in places that worked because they were located in the right place. But other than that, they didn't give any great experience. Now online has taken that convenience of delivery, et cetera, away. So th those kinds of, perhaps those cluster of stores will become more and more challenged. So that's what, that's how we see it. So I think it's quite consistent uh, that, you know, things will change and probably everybody needs to change themselves. I mean, whether you are online or offline, ultimately you have to communicate uh, with your consumers in a much, much more digital way. Uh, Manish, uh, one, uh, one question I had is that, and, and this is probably an experience from the Indian market over the last couple of uh, decades, is that you know, we, we talk of things like sustainability, we talk of, you know, let's say not uh, experimenting in animals and sometimes it all comes at a cost. Now, Indian consumers traditionally have been, while we all want good and we say good, but we don't pay for it. So are you seeing any change in this or do you foresee any change in this pattern uh, from the experience of the last 12 months? So, Naki, if I look at it, you're, you're right as in... Uh whether we were looking at organic cotton or any other innovations, wherein as in uh, consumer was never ready to pay a price for it, as in they wanted it. And they, so Indian consumer, and, and I think it's it's something which was there globally too. So consumer was always ready to pay a price in terms of price value equation, in terms of what they, uh, benefits that they got from the product. But I think today, uh, and that's a change which I see uh, happened globally, probably five years down the line before. India, it happened, started happening around two, two and a half years back. But today, I think uh, consumer looks at things like child labor, things like environment, uh, uh, other things. They look at it as a tangible benefit. So they might not as in say that it's a benefit that's coming to me, but it's a benefit that's coming to the community and they're ready to pay a price. So I'm seeing that change. It's not something which has suddenly as in... Uh, changed overnight it's not that they want to they'll pay 30 40 50 percent premium but yes they are ready to pay that price uh, if isn't if it isn't something which is a big differential and do you see the risk of uh, or, or, or you know suppose there's a brand tomorrow which says you know i'm completely you know vegan or i'm completely environment friendly and, and you know pretty much build the product that way whereas for most companies they have not built that way they are adding it on the side so if a fundamental brand, you'll have to do a lot of communication to connote this. But is there a place for somebody who comes in and says, okay, fine, this is a jeans brand, or this is an apparel brand, which is you know, which is completely social in every element or you know, completely environment friendly. Do you see a space for such a unique brand? See, effectively, as in for a uh, uh, market like India, as in... Uh, if I, I feel that there is a huge opportunity for all sorts of concepts. Uh, if it is so, uh, if there is something which is built on the concept of sustainability, built on the concept of uh, social responsibility, I think there there is a place for it. Uh, I don't know as in, in terms of whether it's it can be a hundred crore brand or a five hundred crore brand, but very clearly as in there is a niche which which can be catered to. But I think the bigger difference wherein as in you were saying that as in other people are adding it as a side tag on. I think. That's something that is changing. So I think the biggest change, uh, as in, and if I look at even that path to digitization, I think everybody, every single organization, and it happened more for the bigger organization, is is our ability or our uh, uh, ability to take risk or uh, as in go for a change. I think that was help as in probably resisting us in terms of making that leap of faith. The consumer was anyway going digital. I think the pandemic has just made us realize in terms of certain brands or people which were laggards in terms of saying that if we don't change, probably we'll not exist. So I think that's the biggest thing. Uh, every single company, every single brand that is there, as in they'll have to 
change as per the requirements of the consumer otherwise as a consumer is not, not going to accept you so it's not something which you can just have a add on you will have to imbibe it as part of your dna perfect so i think there's a see these markets the the reason i asked that question is these all trends look very small when they begin but the pace of change in fact uh, when we were doing a study of the digitization what we realized is probably a decade of change has happened in one year so we never, i mean nobody dreamt it right so sometimes right. you don't realize if if people become socially conscious and i can tell you that uh, when you when you speak one to one i mean anecdotally when you speak to people one is by nature the younger population was anyway more socially responsible they are anyway more and and now what has happened is even if you talk to the older generation uh, i mean i feel that the level of social responsibility or or the whole awareness and thought was the increase significant people are they have actually seen uh, you know the kind of distress that people have faced so this awareness is quite high so probably what you are saying makes sense that there is a niche somebody is probably come and grab it in fact pinaki i'll give you an example there i have a 8 year old daughter and uh, we got a gift from one of the companies where and as in you get these gift with purchases and uh, she uh, we got something which the, you have got those pencils which have got seeds at the back of them which you can plant and then uh, you get plants so sure. once we got that and then she said that from which from which brand did we get this and uh, once i told her the brand she said that this is a good brand because it is thinking about the environment so think of it as an this is a 8 year old and that is the thought process that they have so i think this is something it might be small today but that's the future you know i, I think you were right uh, in from that context uh, ramani how how do you see the beauty industry transforming now because let's be honest i mean uh, that has also been a bit of a tough time and i don't necessarily mean uh, your format or anything i'm just saying the big players had a lot of challenge because if you can't go out then obviously you know how much of beauty product will you use Uh, how do you see that changing do you think uh, you know with the whole mask thing now we are hearing that probably one more year of mask wearing is pretty much i think biden has announced till end of the year hopefully in india we don't have to wait till the end of the year but we still don't know right so how how do you see the impact of all this on on the in the pure beauty business so multi- let me answer this in multiple parts the first is that the inherent need to look good and presentable has always been there okay uh the question is where do you want to look good and presentable is it when in the neighborhood is it on a daily basis is it in a uh, on a special occasion etc so in the initial phase i think when people had all hunkered down i think the first thing we saw was cosmetics collapsed completely yeah but the skin care hair care etc those things were always there and i think there was a larger contribution coming from those and the second part that actually contributes to all this collapse is the fact that you can't move around and meet people okay the moment you started moving around and meeting people you had consumption coming back and sales coming back but it happened in a reverse manner our neighborhood stores came back closer to 100% faster the high streets were lagging behind that and the malls were the worst right so it really depended on how far are you going from your house in the last couple of months i think people have lost either reason or fear whatever you call but i think they are some are being cautious but some are actually moving around with gay abandon so slowly i think we are close to around what 70 75% of the past okay and one of the more important things is that apart from just beauty an important index to remember is that only around i think uh, 15 to 20% of women in india can drive okay there is a larger percentage of male drivers as compared to women so women in order to travel and purchase anything are either dependent on the husband brother son father whatever to take them or public transport okay so categories like beauty which depend a lot on women and required people to go shopping and kind of make decisions for themselves also had an impact because of the moving around of women and the second part also is in at least in my house and anecdotally in several it would be the man who is going out to get something the lady is actually very cautious okay so for until maybe last month i was the only guy going out and getting stuff etc my others will possibly be within the complex so i think a lot of the business depended on ability of people to move around fearlessly okay having said that i think like i said the inherent need to look presentable clean and beautiful 
will drive consumption of products albeit i think some of the ones which were let's say um, selling basis brand pull but not so great on product will take a beating because of challenges that have come up okay one the second this people like us when we had put stuff before the pandemic started seeing those things really pick up during the pandemic so um we said you know we should be uh, accessible to the consumers wherever they want we were just a store for the last 22 years apart from a store we have an app we have a, a m site we have a website and we said we will need to kind of really look at being seamless omni is the future let's be clear about it so we have something which uh, we have an uh, our app has um, a scanner so when you walk into a store we 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 called it self checkout initially so you can walk in you can scan the store's qr code you can scan the barcode of the products you want you can pay and just walk out nobody will interfere okay you don't need to stand at the cash till you don't need anybody to kind of come in your way you see the product scan pay walk pay with your phone no uh, this thing the second thing was curbside delivery which we call click and collect here you can kind of just go to the store on uh, whichever is a store you want to pick up your stuff block your order uh, and drive past and kind of just pick it up on your way home and uh, the larger one is basically express delivery so if you place an order with us today before 3 o'clock we'll deliver it on the same day okay in the cities that we have stores so all these were there and we were trying to push this uh, for a year before the pandemic the moment the pandemic happened uh and the lockdowns happened um we and when the store started opening up so express delivery went up along with uh, e-commerce in general express delivery went up the next thing when we started opening the stores we started telling consumers saying touch free shopping as opposed to just self checkout we said touch free shopping you can just use your phone you don't need to touch anything just touch the products that you want take it pay and move The, the funny reactions were that you know is there a discount if i do that the answer is no so i am not going to use it but it took a couple of months and today we see a significant contribution coming from self checkouts we see a significant the, the contribution of express delivery going up day on day uh, click and collect is okay but in addition to that what we also did was we automated all our store operations during this pandemic the first thing was in the very first month of the lockdown the it department said we don't have any operating load we will accelerate all our development activities so our store operations today are literally paperless the backend does not need to kind of get into anything to do with paper etc and there is technology and that backbone can do a lot in terms of today pushing details about the customer to the cash till when they are interacting with the customer um, and also you know we are, we are recording a whole host of things in terms of purchase behavior using self checkouts etc which we will kind of use to engage more and more with the consumer before the lockdown for almost a year we had something called a skin analyzer we would analyze your skin type in the store and basis that we will therefore also give you a report of your skin type and we will also recommend the kind of regime that suits your skin type okay and we also added brands to those type of products we would do that with a device in the store the moment uh, the lockdown started and the store opened after that we couldn't touch with a device or anything so we went on to an online version of that which is a selfie based solution a selfie based technically may not be as efficacious as a device uh, report but we figured out globally whichever is the best and actually tested it out we found a selfie based solution we launched it uh, in the store so we can do that without a touch we can we we've also started delivering it on our app so a consumer can actually get their skin analysis using our app and get their entire skin report the products and the regime that we recommend that they use for their particular skin type so uh, ramaji is, one question uh, you seem to have made a lot of investments in all of this technologies and whatever and uh, do you uh, how confident are you of the roi finally because these have to be long term investments because maybe it works now but but you are confident so, so that is one thing which i think you asked even manish i think it is not about the cost these are not expensive okay and there again uh, so like like when somebody says pardon my this thing but when somebody says we need an erp solution you'll typically say either you do a sap or a, you know a microsoft or an oracle or something like that you can do it yourself also okay and it can be a a, a socialized thing which need not be dependent on anybody and all that similarly i think these are solutions which are not necessarily expensive okay 
we are we are not a high overheads company we are very very uh, bootstrapped if you ask me and i think it requires thinking to kind of say that we will deliver the solution and you know uh, it in the, there are some of these uh, viral uh, whatsapp clips that i watched there's something which came in recently where somebody looks like he's riding a bicycle uh, sorry you're riding a motorcycle but when the camera pans to the side it's actually <laughs> a bicycle behind a motorcycle cover so the front end experience can be fantastic okay right. but the back end very very simple it need not be too evolved and all that you know i think half the guys who talk to, talk about big solutions etc come with huge overheads and licensing costs i think good point i think that's a very valid point and that is probably how do we make simple i think uh, malika mentioned uh, this uh, some time back that how do we make simple but malika i have a question which is slightly i know we have about 5 minutes time one question to you so you have been in online so you have gone through it even before i mean you started uh, from that what are some of the risks so do you have for example you can go grossly wrong and in digital you know the wrong will be big and amplified right unlike a store where you have one incident which is localized so have you had any personal experience that you can share what kind of uh, you know best practices can companies follow when they are moving more digital you are muted uh, malik yes sir so i you know i i actually think that the uh, you know from the cost perspective the risk of doing something or experimenting is lower online than offline right because if i'm present on on retail what i have to do is i have to meet a certain volume to kind of even run it as an experiment versus on an online digital world what i can do is that i can take something run it as an experiment on my own website see how that does and then kind of explore and use it everywhere else right so i think it's the other way around do i completely hear you on saying that if you are on digital and your consumer is digitally very savvy uh, if there is a negative uh, experience with the product or the delivery or the brand the person just goes and puts up on any of those social handles and from my last experience for about 3 to 4 years i think the reason why they do it is because they believe that nobody from the brand is responding back to them right like nobody is you know like unless someone is really really like nasty the first point of contact for everybody would be the brand to kind of say that i've had an inconvenience is there any way that you can solve for it if at that point of time the customer finds a resolution you know then the person doesn't escalate it so it's also about the brand right is how fast you are in kind of having a conversation with them like you reach out to us we have a chat saying that within the next 24 hours your problem will be resolved by the customer care as long as if that's not done and and you know we refuse to respond or we're not having a communication is when the consumer actually goes and puts it out all over the place saying you know and they'll tag the founder they'll tag the investor they'll tag probably everybody on the other side and please notice in here but i think the attempt of that from the consumer's end is just to get noticed so as long as the brands are constantly like kind of focusing on customer experience i don't think the experiment if you want to run offline versus online online is much easier and low cost to run than offline any any examples of big mistakes you could make in communication one is the complaint of product i you are right and and i personally have had experience where i mean i go to certain websites because not because they are the cheapest because i know it's it's without headache and i have had yeah. cases where you know it's a big brand big name but the moment there is a problem nobody bothers to respond i mean i mean some of the non uh, i mean offline players do much better than that yeah but 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 uh, what i'm now asking is what about the communication that you are doing you know you make a mistake uh, and and it can really bring you down so uh, is there any learning uh, that you personally experienced where one wrong communication or something got misconstrued and we have seen enough examples on twitter people writing something and being misinterpreted uh, you know by consumers no i i haven't honestly just would thankfully not had the experience yet um i think what we've been always very cautious of is that if we put out a communication out we back it with facts there are no lewd comments passed from the brand on anything uh we haven't used anything to defame somebody else to put ourselves on a you know like a superiority paddle or anything so we don't do any of those practices we basically use digital as a moat to add comfort and clarity in our consumers life right you have got an overload of information you are looking out for a simplified communication for the same and that's what i'll give it to you if there is something that you want to have a conversation with me on please come and have a look at it so the most i think the times when the communication can go wrong is if you put out faulty claims or very high claims right and just just not backed by either science or data uh, we haven't done that uh, and because we haven't done that we haven't had experience of the likewise that you're talking about 
Tell me when everybody spoke of omni-channel, so there's an audience question. What is the right balance between, uh, you know, I mean, what is, is it 50-50, 60-40 or, you know, you live, how, how, do, how do you strike a good balance? So I think it's very specific to every product and every category that you operate in. So if you ask me, I've got in my portfolio products like baby washes, baby shampoos and lotions that are slightly more, uh, you know, more relevant to a larger set of audience. For those, I will look out for a more equilibrium balance between the offline and online. But at the same point of time, I also have niche products in my portfolio. So we cater to creating the safest range of products for expecting moms and babies, right? So from a mom's perspective, I also have products which will last her only about three to four months into her journey. Now, those products can't go onto an offline platform because by the time they actually reach and hit the platform there, it would be time and it will become redundantly useless for them, right? So I think... The right balance between uh, online and retail would largely depend on the choice of product that you're looking to sell there, right? And what is the portfolio that you're putting out? And it will be different from every business to business. And there will be an element of margin also involved because, you know, that also plays a big role in offline, online, apart from bar pack size, margin, product categories, there are a whole lot of variables, right? Margin, not and so the much bigger... because uh, uh, it, it's a decent margin conversation even on an online front. But yes, in terms of how much penetration you're looking to drive from the product, it will be a huge factor in you figuring out uh, how much you want to expose the product on an offline world. I think the balance actually will be decided by the consumer. Yeah. I think, I mean, all of us, I think today we are okay to walk to our neighborhood and kind of buy something. We are okay to buy stuff online. We're okay to go to a high street. I think it's really the consumption pattern that will decide the balance in terms of the output. In terms of investment and input, I think you've got to be equally invested and in a modular fashion. You don't need to kind of sink in huge costs and wait for the consumer to come. I think uh, a wiser thing would be to kind of keep investing and keep increasing your investments and efforts depending on the consumption traction. So uh, I think uh, same thing, like for example, even on Netflix today, uh, an OTT platform, you can watch it on the laptop, you watch it on your phone, you watch it on your pad, you watch it on the television. I think they just need to kind of start building mini theaters to watch OTT content for small groups. That's it. So I think you have multiple consumption points and depending on your need state, you will pick and choose whatever. So I think that will eventually strike the balance for the moment. I think the online has a certain increase uh, and I think uh, it will increase. People will kind of basically say, I'd like to, depending on the conveniences or the convenience of, a, of an option for that topical situation, if it's convenience, if, if, I mean, it's also a set of malls saying that if you want a convenient shopping experience, don't enter a mall because you'll take at least an hour to go and come, right? A neighborhood store is more convenient. So similarly, if you want something right now, you might still be able to just call your grocer or these days just enter your grocer's store on the WhatsApp through a chat bot and get it delivered in half an hour. Whereas, you know, actually going to uh, maybe a large horizontal portal might deliver only after 24 hours. So I think those will possibly decide your balance. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Ramani. So Tirthankar, coming back to you now, you've heard, uh, you know, a whole host of, uh, you know, views on, on how to connect better. To the world. What would be a few points that you would like to summarize uh, today's discussion, maybe leave it with the audience? I, I saw one question, like, what would be the defining technology in the retail space? Uh, that's a very interesting question, and 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 uh, I, I would certainly say automatic identification technology, and in that I would mean RFID, because the trend that we're seeing is that uh, uh, just to give you the numbers, we are the world's largest UHF, which is ultra high frequency RFID manufacturer in the world. We have the biggest capacity with respect to RFID inlays. Walmart is the biggest customer; they're the ones pushing for RFID in retail space, uh, we know for a fact that RFID works in the supply chain and the retail atmosphere because uh, you name any brand, be it Zara, be it Marks & Spencer, be it Uniqlo, be it Mango, everybody is using our inlays and it's because there's ROI. Right? Nobody's going to invest in the business if there's no ROI. And we are seeing increasing uh, investment with respect to that, even in India for local brands. Uh, we have had cases where a local retail chain in Ahmedabad is implementing this technology. Uh, they, they have about eight stores and, and, and they saw the ROI in that. So I think the future is going to be automatic. 
I mean, you have barcodes, you have, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, QR codes and, and things like that. But those are one to one. So, for example, when you when when you check out, you'll have to check out one item at a time. The advantage of RFID is that you can put 20, 30, 40, 50 pieces of clothing together and get the bill in three seconds. Right. And that is the convenience that people or shoppers are looking at. And brands like Uniqlo, uh, 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 like Mintra in India, are leading the way forward with respect to implementing the technology. And I think that is the way forward where the major, uh, as per the survey also, which was which you said, is going to be experience and convenience. And e is something which actually meets experience with convenience. And it's not just e-commerce sticking to e-commerce. e com is slowly getting into brick and mortar as well. Uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, Roadster as a brand is expanding its physical store presence all over India. Now that is because the larger volume would be through e -com, but for the premium segment to get that experience, you still need a physical store. So a physical store does not automatically go out of the overall picture. It is there to enhance the brand image. And for that, you need cutting it technology to make sure that the experience that people have in that store is something which, which, which they'll talk about to their colleagues or to, to, to other uh, uh, friends that uh, they've experienced in that particular store. So we are going to see a lot more premium legacy experience stores uh, coming across over the next five years in India. And we're going to see a, a greater, faster adoption of RFID technology uh, uh, in, in this region, for sure. Thanks. Uh, Thank I just, uh, sorry, I just want to make a point there. So I think for me, as in if I look at it, the future is about experiences, whether you deliver it through technology or through human interfaces. So I think that's where the differentiation would lie. So there is a consumer, and if we have seen it, and if I look at December, January numbers, there is a consumer who wants to go to the store and shop. I think the differentiation, how you are able to create it, whether you use technology or you use humor interfaces or other things, I think that's where the future lies. So it's all about evolution and uh, as in reaching out to your consumer and uh, giving him a better experience, whichever way. Thanks, Manish. So I think what we consistently heard is digital is here to stay and it's an omni-channel uh, question. It is no longer digital, offline, online. It's just going to be omni-channel. Even if you are a fashion brand, apparel to food to anything. So that's a very clear message. The second message, it's all about experience. Uh, you know, be it store, be it online, ultimately you have to deliver a very good uh, experience. Uh, the third message is you have to be responsive. Ultimately, you know, that's where the consumer is going. So these are the three uh, key messages uh, in what I say smart connect because ultimately this will deliver that smart connect to consumer. It's not about being more digital. It, it's about being all of these. So thanks a lot uh, to all the panelists. It was a wonderful discussion and uh, I hope, uh, you know, there are a lot of learnings that we carry uh, forward from the kind of experiences that uh, you all share. Thanks a lot. Of Thank you. Thank you.